live from uh, from our GVR studios tonight. Uh, so we are going to meet our candidates as we get them on Zoom. Candidates, are you there? We hope so. And there they are. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. First, we're going to introduce 65-year-old Drew Bessinger. He was so. first elected at the Clovis City Council in 2017. He's Zoom. running for his first second full term and third overall. He has a long-time background in law enforcement, serving as captain in the Clovis Police Department, as well as serving as chief of the Fresno Yosemite Airport Police Force. And he's been the interim chief for several Central Valley cities. He grew up in New Jersey and has lived in Clovis for the last 38 years. Drew, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Guy Redner, he's 36 years old. He is a caretaker. He has lived in Clovis for 25 years, attending Clovis schools, and his family still lives in the area. Guy, welcome. And Joe Abear, 64, is the Parks and Community Services Director for Madeira. He has lived in Clovis for 13 years. His wife, Lyndon, himself have four adult daughters and two grandchildren. Joe, thanks for joining us tonight. And Martin Salas and Mark Kazanjian were also invited, but they have declined our invitation tonight. So let's get right to the questions. We always hear the term, the Clovis way of life. And I want to know from our candidates, what does that term mean to you? And we'll start with Drew Bessinger. To you, uh, it will start with Drew a community Bessinger. feeling that you feel safe going down the street. To you, you have good schools that your community. children, your grandchildren go to. That you have community events safe, which safe are you have uh, good which draw that your children, people from all over the valley. Uh, rodeo, big hat days, Clovis are, Fest. Um, you feel safe walking through your farmer's market downtown. You have uh, public servants who serve uh, their community well. They're very dedicated. And we also have a community that when they see something, they they call the police or they'll call uh, authorities and report it because they take pride in their community. So the community pride is a big element of the, the Clovis way of life. Redner, what does that term mean to you? What is the Clovis way of life? So the Clovis way of life for me means community. I think Clovis has a outstanding community. I talk to my neighbors, my neighbors talk to me if we need help. You know, we have our community events like the farmer's market, big hat days and the rodeo. And it's about all of us just kind of coming together and making Clovis as great as it can be. So the, I think that is basically the the crux of it is Clovis is about community. It's a place you want to raise your family. Community. I'm sure that's a common theme we're hearing tonight. What does Clovis way of life mean to you? Sure. And, you know, actually, I, I'm a, I wasn't born and raised here. Uh, I've been here for 13 years and uh, we, we like Clovis. And uh, one of the things that we really enjoy about Clovis is when we leave, we, my wife and I, we travel quite a bit. I used to travel quite a bit for work as well. I used to travel about 100,000 miles a year uh, for my occupation at the time. And every time we come back, there's all this feeling of peace and safety. And we feel like, ah. But let me be real clear. Um, like I said, I'm not a, a native uh, to, to Clovis. I, I'm, I'm a transplant to this area. And uh, at my age, when I meet people who are my age, who look like me and who might've been here their whole life, they have a different perspective of what Clovis, the Clovis way is. And I think uh, that stigma hasn't really, uh, really gone away. And that's something that we have to work, work on. Uh, I have who don't look like you, maybe if you can expound on that. So I'm, I, I want to expand on in probably in the seventies, there was a stigma. This, this Clovis was known as a sundowner town. Uh, people uh, who were people of color didn't feel welcome here. I've never experienced that personally in the 13 years. And I think that's something that we need to work on and change that, that attitude because there's people who don't live here who look on, on the outside, look in and have a different perspective of Clovis. And like I said, we, we enjoy it here. We've had a good time, but I want to get that out on the table because actually we conducted a, a, a poll of a lot of the people who are supporting my candidacy inside and outside of Clovis and that that perspective was shared. And I, I, I'm I an advocate for Clovis by saying, hey, look, I've this is a great place to be, but I think that, that's something that we need to work on as we move in the future. All right, well, uh, Guy and Drew, uh, 
based on Joe, what he just said, how do you make Clovis a more welcoming town for those not, you know, what's to say, for non-whites? Uh, Guy, let's get your perspective. Well, in my experience, Clovis is really good about our racial diversity and our racial equality. Um, I, I think it starts in the schools. You know, we got to have our multi-ethnic students working together to kind of break down those historically established walls. And by, how do I put it? Um, so by getting them to work together and breaking them down, you know, you, you understand, you know, going to your friend's house, if your friend's not of the same ethnicity, you can learn like, hey, he's just like me, a little bit different, but he's got some similarities there. Like, uh, and personally, in my experience, my brother has been dating a, a Salvadorian woman and they have a child together now. I have a great two-year-old nephew. And so there's, for me, like, that's not something I was used to and learning how they run their household is a lot different from the way we ran ours growing up. And it, it just, I, I just have to accept it. And that's fine. Like I'm perfectly okay having our two households merge together into one stronger household. Yeah, and Drew, you have a unique perspective as a longtime captain in the Clovis Police Department. And we've heard criticism from the Clovis Police Department as of late that maybe they're not, not diverse, but maybe not diverse enough. So what's your perspective uh, from diversifying the police department and whether Clovis is a diverse and welcoming place for non-whites? Well, let me start with, with what Joe said. There are people who perceive that they are going to be treated differentially. And perception is reality to folks. So what we have to do as a community, as neighbors, is we need to be as welcoming to them as we would to anybody else. Um, we have diverse neighborhoods. Um, I, I, I understand what things die hard. And that perception complaint, is still, it's still there. It's gonna, it keeps dying hard, but we're going to keep working at it. Um, to to address the diversity at the police department, I've been part of teams where we have uh, we have made strides and a lot of efforts to get a more diverse workforce. Um, if you look at a police car in Clovis, you're going to see uh, you're going to see African American, Latinos, Pacific Islanders. We have people from um, from the gay and lesbian community. Um, I think you know. People are surprised sometimes. We had a, one day we had a we had a swearing in of five police officers. Every single one of them was Latino, and it was not like, hey, this is a big deal. It's like, hey, these are the five best people we found. Um, so we just need to, yeah, you need to take your little victories, and eventually everybody will see. Uh, my 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 thought process was wrong. This is a great community. Thank you so much. Now, in a GV Wire survey of Clovis residents, public safety was the most important issue. I don't think that should be a surprise. So I'd like to talk about public safety. Uh, where do you rate it in Clovis? And is there a magic number of police officers on the force? And how do we get there? And Joe, we'll start with you. So, um, yeah, I, I, I know we're, we don't have enough police, police officers. I think right now we're right around what, 112, which is probably about 30 short of what we, we should be is what I hear. Uh, I spent some time with uh, the current police chief asking him the same question. Uh, there, you know, I guess uh, there was a time we had uh, almost like 160, I believe, police officers, but uh, I don't know what the magic number is, but it, we're not there. And how do we get there? Uh, we actually need more uh, more revenue. I think we have have some some things on the books to increase our our, our police force. Uh, as far as uh, the the measure that's going to increase the uh, sales tax for hotels, uh, which will I think provide another five hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which uh, will help us uh, staff it. But that's still that's directionally correct, but not not it's woefully short of what we need. Uh, we've seen a rise. Favor of Measure B. I am very much so. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good thing. Again, it's directionally yeah. correct, but uh, it still falls short about what, what we need. And so that, that's just one, one thing. So we, we do need more police officers. We've seen a, a rise in property crimes, uh, porch pirates. We've seen uh, catalytic converter thefts, people breaking into uh, mailboxes. And those are things that uh, we, we really need to, uh, you know, band together and find a way to do it. Right now, what we've seen is that uh, we do have good response rates from our police. They're, they're responding to all calls, un all calls, unlike other cities who are only uh, re responding to priority one. So uh, I, I think, you know, right now we're, we're doing well, but we, we, we need to do better. Hi. How would you evaluate the Clovis public safety? We all, we'll include fire and, and police in that. And measure B, where are you on that? And then do you have a magic number of how many police officers that the city of Clovis needs? So I believe that the Clovis public safety, uh, so fire and police do an amazing job. They are top notch in my opinion. I, when I first started running for the selection, I had some ideas that I wanted to implement. And I was like, okay, when I looked over the budget, I realized how much, it's like 70, 80 million that police and fire take from the general fund each year. And that number just blew my mind. And I was like, okay, so maybe we can roll some of that back and I can have money for my other side projects that I was thinking of doing. And then I met with the fire chief and the police chief and realized that that budget is needed, it is very necessary. Um, I do think now that they do need uh, more money, um, to be frank. Uh, I, yes, I do support Measure B. All right, Drew, Drew Bessinger, a longtime captain in the Clovis Police Department. Do you have, uh, from that perspective, how many police officers that the city needs, and how do you get there? Well, in uh, 2007, we had 116 police officers. Uh, the recession, we had to, we, unfortunately, we had to gut programs, uh, and we ended up, re you know, people left. Uh, they had incentives to retire, uh, and by 2011, we were down to 93. We're back to 112 in a community of, of 115,000 people. We, we need to have, at the very least, a minimum of one per thousand. That would take us to 125 officers. Uh, the, one of the problems is recruiting. Uh, I teach at the police academy. I've taught there for 25 years. Uh, there are fewer and fewer people who want to get into law enforcement because of the, well, because of the beating they've taken in the last three years. Um, but one of the other difficulties is the PERS retirement rates have spiked from at one point thirteen percent almost up to fifty percent, um, and that's not expected to to take to, to curve back down until twenty thirty. So there's going to come a point where we're going to have to make some hard choices. Um, I do support Measure B. I think it'll take us. It'll, it's not taking us exactly where we need to go, but it's a good step. Uh, potentially, we we get one point three million dollars annually from our card room. Uh, that's why Prop 26 is so important that it doesn't pass. Uh, and if we can, potentially we need to revisit those fees and maybe maybe increase those and earmark those specifically for public safety. All right, Drew, thank you so much. Now I'd like to invite Clovis Unified Trustee Stephen Fogg to ask a question. Hey, th thank you. Uh, you know, I, it's often said, you know, you know, people move to Clovis for the schools and they stay in Clovis for the community. And, you know, one of the things we do, like I mentioned about schools, is, is educating people so they can have jobs. And what I would like to know is, I think, we, I think we do a great job in Clovis Unified to educate kids, but I think there's a huge disconnect between educating the kids and getting jobs locally in Clovis. And I think that's where Clovis City Council needs to kind of step and say, okay, how do we gap that between our students coming into our community? I would like to know what some ideas they may have to maybe bridge that gap to get our kids that are educated, either career educated or, you know, when they come back, how are they going to get them involved in jobs? I would just as nice some ideas and as a business owner, would yeah. that be interesting if they said we're going to give you an incentives to hire kids out of high school as builders and we're going to give you discounts if you hire these kids and this? That would be an interesting way to do it. Could Clovis City do that? 
I don't know. I mean, those are ideas I'd like to hear these candidates. What would you do to, to bridge between us educating kids and then getting jobs in the community? All right, uh, Joe, we'll, we'll let you take that one first. What are your ideas for getting the youth of Clovis more jobs? So, uh, you know, we, we, to, to have more jobs, you need, you need more, more jobs. I mean, to, to have kids, that have, I mean, we need more, more industry. Uh, we have a lot of retail in Clovis. I would love to see a lot more, more manufacturing. A lot of that starts with economic development and attracting uh, businesses that have that. I used to work for a manufacturer here for about 10 and a half years, uh, Pelco, and they went away. Uh, I would love to see partnerships with, uh, with Fresno State uh, to, to actually have a pipeline from, with our engineers. Uh, we, you know, this is, uh, 2022. We have a lot of, lot of electronic capability, uh, where we could have R and D centers here. Uh, I, I would like to see, uh, uh, us attracting those kind of, kind of industries here where actually we could create more jobs, uh, for our young people coming out of high school. Uh, there's a number of people that we educate here, uh, and they leave. They leave and then they come back to start families, and I really I, I I see that, but there's not a not a lot of industry to support that. So we have a lot of brain drain uh, in that. But what we really would like to see is that uh, people just uh, uh, creating more jobs through through attracting businesses that that would have those jobs that we could uh, actually promote and and actually do things like internships and co-op programs for for our our young people. Uh, Drew Bessinger, let's uh, hear from you. Answering Dr. Fogg's question, you know, how do you get more jobs and in industry focused on Clovis Unified students? Well, we we do work with the uh, Fresno EDC with hiring incentives. Uh, there's some there, there could be some tax breaks that the the city could potentially do uh, to as an incentive for for businesses to come. Uh, the northeast part of the city is going to be. Uh, ripe for uh, a, a light industrial and some of that's gonna be geared towards medical. Um, I was at the, uh, the uh, breakfast this morning for the Clovis Community College president and they were discussing the pathway program where we get kids from high school and get them into STEM programs at City College, at City College, I'm sorry, I should have turned this phone off, at City College, get them to Fresno State, and then get them potentially to uh, a uh, medical school or into the medical business, and they, they'd have great jobs. Drew, thank you. Uh, Guy, what, what do you say about this? So I have an interesting perspective about this because I am a victim of the system. Um, so I graduated from Clovis High in 2004. Um, I got two associate degrees in computer science from ITT Tech in Clovis in 2009 and 2011. And there's no tech industry in Clovis. All the tech industry is up north in the Bay. You know, we have Bitwise in Fresno, but I hate to steal Joe's answer, but we need to bring that industry in. We've got a lot of high school graduates. We have a very successful high school graduate uh, statistic. Uh, a lot of those graduates are going on to college. We need to bring those jobs into Clovis. If those jobs aren't here, the people are going to move away because that's where the money's at. Um, another option that we could look into would be work a work from home solution. With the pandemic hitting, with the pandemic hitting, a lot of companies tested out work from home. They had to to survive, and I think that that is an area that is kind of being rolled back. And I don't think it should be. I think we should be utilizing it more. Thank you very much. Now, last census numbers had Clovis at a population of about 125,000. It's only going to go up. It's only going to grow. So I want to know what your vision is for the growth of Clovis. Where are you going to build homes? Where are you going to build retail? Especially where are you going to build affordable housing, which has always been an issue in Clovis. And uh, Councilman Bessinger, we'll start with you. Councilman, uh, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we have growth areas you've already targeted. The Loma Vista area is uh, built out fairly well. There's still some areas for development, especially commercial. Uh, the next area is going to be Heritage Grove, which is going to be north of, of, uh, of Shepherd, uh, almost all the way up to Copper at some point. 
uh, that'll be probably 20 years plus out with some commercial growth around there. Uh, so that that's kind of going to be our growth areas um, to talk about affordable housing. That the, the problem the problem that we have with affordable housing is that it's a misnomer. Uh, when you build a dense three to four story apartment complex, it, it's got a pencil for the people who build it. Um, and so I don't know that those apartments are going to be affordable. Uh, and right now, if the city of Clovis, the state of California, the county, if we get involved, it becomes a prevailing wage job, which means that it's going to cost maybe a third more to build it. Uh, and unless it's subsidized, you can't uh, you can't make it pay. I mean, you know, you, if you're looking for an $800 apartment, that's not going to happen. Uh, so we can we've already set aside areas of growth for for affordable housing. Uh, there are things we worked with the Fresno Housing Authority and put in a uh, a, a really nice apartment complex on alluvial in Willow. And there's maybe there's small other small bites we can make when the money becomes available. Uh, we waived we waived quite a lot of fees to get that in, and hopefully maybe we can work with the housing authority in the future. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Drew made a good point that uh, you know affordable housing is somewhat of a misnomer, and the real trick of it is lots of subsidies from government agencies. So where do you find that money? Where is the city of Clovis, as you as a councilman, willing to provide? These subsidies, how much and where do you build affordable housing and how do you recruit these affordable housing developers, which, which are specialized developers? How do you get them to the city of Clovis? So, um, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, I, I'm going to be able to solve the affordable housing program as a council person, but I can be an advocate for affordable housing. As Councilman Bessinger mentioned that uh, there's, there's designated spaces. We have zoning for those but attracting developers to, to actually come in is gonna take a lot of, lot of planning, a lot of uh, uh, discussions with, uh, with, with the planning, planning board uh, and working together with uh, the fellow council members to find, find a way, a, a mutual, mutually agreeable way to uh, address the issue. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, we have a, uh, an issue as far as uh, prevailing wages, attracting uh, when we're using public funds. Uh, so that that's an impediment to, to developers. But I, I also think there, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, uh, inhibiting us right now is that the, that prices are going up. Uh, our home prices are going up. We've got landlords that are raising rents uh, at an incredible pace. I think in, I was reading a study the other day and, and uh, prior to the pandemic, the median house, house price was around $200,000. Median right now is about 405. Uh, so, you know, what, how do you define affordability? And so how do you subsidize that? Do you talk to uh, the state and state and federal government for, for grant assistance? Uh, there's a lot of tough conversations around that. It's not an easy fix to say, hey, we're just gonna have affordable housing, but I think we, we need to have those discussions. And I think uh, that that's something that I can do. Wait, would you be willing to support any policies like rent control or any kind of stabilization that might control those prices? You, you know, I, I think uh, right now we've got people who can't afford to live here. Who, uh, who, in, and we already mentioned there's not a lot of high-paying jobs. We've got a lot of retail. So yeah, I would be be in favor of rent control. I'm a landlord. I don't have a problem with uh, with stabilized rents. Uh, I have a number number of properties in Clovis. Uh, we try to keep our rent stable. Uh, we're not looking to gouge anybody, but uh, we understand that people need to make living wages in order to uh, to, to pay their rents. All right, Joe, thank you. Guy, we'll get to you in just if you're watching on Facebook, please hit like on the stream if you're liking what you're hearing. I'm David Town with GV Wire. We are talking with candidates for the Clovis City Council. Guy Redner, uh, we've heard a lot of policies of ideas of how to get more housing there. We we'll want to hear your ideas, where to build them, and where do you stand on possible policies of rent control and rent stabilization? So I grew up in affordable housing. I uh, lived in apartments off of Minnewall and Barstow for some odd 13 years. Um, and in the time from when we moved in to the time that we left, our rent probably increased three to $400 over that time. We never once got new carpets. I mean, there was a lot of things 
that could have been improved on in the time that we were there and it, everything stayed the same. I think we need to be a bit harder on the landlords out there. Um, I do think rent control is something we need to look into. I mean, we've got people on disability and senior citizens who are getting their pensions. Those aren't really going up. And if rent keeps going up, then that means that they can't afford to live here. I know the current sitting council members make about $19,000 yearly. It's considered a part-time position. You can't live in Clovis for that. It is impossible. Even in affordable housing, you can't live in Clovis for that. So I definitely think that it is not an easy challenge to meet, but it is one that we're going to have to take the steps to do. Real with you, just real briefly, where do you stand on rent control policies? I I don't think that the city government has a has a standing to interfere in the position in the relationship between renters and landlords. Uh, I, I thought that the eviction moratorium uh, programs were a mistake and people took advantage of them. I mean, there were good folks who were struggling and I understand that, but my, my son's in the, in, the, in the business of property management with a large company and people trashed apartments, they didn't pay the rent and just walked out. Uh, one of the things that the city of Clovis does to, to hold substandard uh, um, properties accountable is we do code enforcement. Um, I've been personally involved uh, with slumlords and and people who are taking advantage of poor folks, and we have uh, we have caused them a lot of trouble and made them uh, bring their property up to standards. And that's uh, I think that's that's our role, uh, not being involved in rent stabilization or eviction moratoriums. All right, Councilman Benster, thank you very much. Uh, once again, to ask a question, Clovis Unified Trustee Stephen Fogg. Thank you. You know, certainly building a community starts again with our youth and starts in our schools. And I would like to know any ideas that they may have, because I think that we could do a better job in Clovis of having youth programs for high school kids, whether volunteer. If you said, yeah, I want to volunteer for something. Is it easy for them to find out how do I go volunteer? Does our city have some programs to say, hey, this is where you can go volunteer. This is where you can do this. Do they have jobs for high school students? I mean, high school students comes to me, they have a hard time finding work sometimes, being in high yeah. school. And so who's gonna help them? This, we're educating them, who's gonna help them find work? I would like to see our city, yeah, I would like our city government to have programs to find kids to work. We, fought, we talked about jobs for adults, but how about starting kids young working? I bet you were very young when you started working, is that not right? I did. Yeah. Is that not is that not something we've lost in our in our society now? We kids sometimes don't even have a job until they're twenty. All right. Well, let's hear from uh, Guy Render. Guy, you're one of the younger candidates running here. Uh, what should the city be doing to increase uh, job programs for the youth? Well, when I was sixteen, I got my first job uh, working at the grocery outlet on Clovis and Shaw. Um, I was lucky. Um, the manager was my neighbor at the apartments I was living at, and I had to leave once high school started back up. It was a, basically a summer gig and then high school started and I had to stop because my grades were declining and I wanted to put a focus on my education over a focus on money. Um, I think in order to solve the current issue, we need to get those retail jobs, those entry level positions that are undrained. So to kind of backtrack a little bit, we need the college graduate level jobs. Guy, how, how jobs. should how what can the city do? What should the role of the city be in this? Just real briefly, and we'll it's, go to Joe. Yeah, it's it's getting those jobs for the people that need them and attracting those businesses. Mm -hmm. Right, and Joe, uh, what should the role of the city be to help get these youth these jobs? Yeah, and I, it, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, I, I, you mentioned I work for the city of Madeira, and actually we have uh, tomorrow our very first meeting. We've established a youth commission, uh, and we're meeting, having our first meeting at uh, my office tomorrow with a bunch of young people. And part of our our charter, and it's our first meeting, but part of our charter is uh, education, vocational training, um, and uh, 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 civic civic engagement. And so that's what we're focusing on. Actually, we've uh, start, started having some preliminary com conversations with some of the trades 
uh, who are looking for uh, apprentices. And so we're, we'll be addressing that. So I think in Clovis, it would be to our advantage to establish a uh, maybe a youth commission like we're doing in Madera uh, to kind of talk to the young people, get them excited and get them engaged in, in the things I just mentioned. All right, and Drew, how do we match up employers with the, the youth? Uh, what do you think about the idea of a youth commission? I, I think that's a, a very viable suggestion. I, I think uh, getting the parties involved, you know, the, our, our businesses, our, our youth. Uh, I mean, one of the problems we're running into is that we have employers that when you walk into their restaurant, there's a sign that says, please be patient with us. We're having difficulty finding people. Uh, maybe our, one of our rec programs needs to start teaching job skills. Um, how, to, how to write a resume, how to balance your checkbook, uh, how to do things that used to be taught uh, by families that frankly aren't being taught anymore. I think, I think giving people access, I mean, Clovis Adult uh, does a great job with some things. Uh, and we could also, you know, uh, at Clovis Community College, they have a lot of programs that under kids who are still in high school can be involved in and get college credit and be out, get themselves on the way to uh, having a better job. All right, Drew, thank you very much. Gentlemen, I have one more question of substance uh, before we get to our close. And if public safety is issue number one, I think homeless may be issue number two. So what is your plan? You know, if there's a homeless person uh, lingering in front of a school or in front of a business area, what do you do about that? And if there was going to be a homeless shelter built in the city of Clovis, where should it go? And Drew will stay with you on this one. So let, let's, let, let me let me address the last part first, the homeless shelter issue. I I would be open to the conversation of a of helping homeless with some type of sheltering, um, you know. But it first off, it, the city can't afford that. That has to be subsidized by the state or the federal government. Because quite frankly, the city of Clovis didn't cause this problem. The state of California really asked caused a much larger homeless problem by, by just releasing people from jails and making drug use either legal or, or decriminalize it to the point where there's no, there's no incentive like drug courts used to have to get people back into, into treatment. I would be against a, a, a homeless shelter that was just sheltering people. It has to, there has to be a holistic approach. We need to get them the mental health help they need, the addiction help they need, get them into transitional housing, get them into a pathway for job skills or education. But we can't just throw money at this and give somebody a bed to sleep in because the unfortunate truth is a lot of people who with mental health problems and addiction problems are only interested in getting through the day. They've lost hope. We need to try to give them hope, but uh, to, to address the first part of the question, if somebody's causing a problem in the community, if they're violating the law, if they're making people feel unsafe, that is our responsibility to the remainder of the citizens that we can't let homeless people, drug, drug addicted people, people with mental health issues, cause them to be unsafe. Uh, Guy, uh, real briefly, uh... You know, constituent calls you, say there's a problem with homeless in their area. How do you deal with that? And do you believe a shelter should be built in the city of Clovis? So I do believe that Clovis should implement a short-term shelter, probably on the border between Fresno and Clovis, because I feel like a lot of the homelessness are coming in from Fresno. Um, but I also believe in housing first, and that is putting a roof over their, their heads, giving them a bed. And from there, once you're not worried about where you're gonna sleep for the night or if you're gonna be safe, then we can work on the more fundamental problems of addiction and mental health. And I think that we have a great spot over by Clovis Community where we could put a building like that because they're homeless, they're not gonna have a vehicle, they're gonna have issues getting that medical treatment that they need. So we need to build a housing first development where the resources are at um in addition to that yeah, we'll, we'll leave, leave it there and joe why don't you close this one out uh, your thoughts on how you deal with the homeless situation and what do you think of a shelter in the city yeah you know um as a parks director i deal with homelessness almost daily 
uh, on a daily basis. And let me tell you, it's a very complex subject. It's not something that's easily resolvable by warehousing people and getting them out of sight. Uh, we, uh, I think there needs to be a good, good uh, way to look at things as far as uh, providing a triage uh, to look at the levels of homelessness. It's very complex. If there's layers to it. You have people who have PTSD, who are veterans. We have people with mental health issues. We have drug addiction. We have people who are, who are just criminals out on the street. And those are all the people I deal with on a regular basis. One of the things that I, I would advocate is that I'm currently on the board of directors for a nonprofit called Salt and Light. Their approach is a little bit different from everybody else, but it seems to, to be effective. Uh, one of the things they really uh, promote is that we promote uh, treating, treating people as human beings with dignity and providing a sense of community. Uh, what I found is when I deal with homeless people, when I treat them and look them in the eye and talk to them as humans, I usually get a response. If I, if, if I, some of my colleagues or some of the people I know treat them as the other, then we don't get the same results. So I think the triage approach is, is probably the best. Um, where we would put that, I think there's a lot of discussions that would have to take place. If I'm, I would advocate a shelter in, in Clovis, uh, I think we've, we've, developed a, uh, from talking to citizens, we've developed this attitude that we just want to kick the problem down the road and send it over to Fresno or send it somewhere else. Well, really, it's all of us. We're all human beings. I've heard people talk about, hey, this, these, these people, if they don't do what we want, we don't want them here. Well, that's, that's we, we would treat a stray dog better than that. So I, I think really we have to show compassion, treat people with dignity, and actually have a sense of how do we address this problem from a hu humanistic approach. All right, Joe, thank you. All right, it's time we uh, close our debate. Of course, there's always more questions than uh, time, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll give you one minute each to uh, answer this question. We'll start with you, Councilman Bessinger. You're the only incumbent in this race. Why should the voters of Clovis reelect you? Well, the, the uh, best predictor of future performance is past performance. I've been a public servant uh, for over four decades when I, since when I joined the Army at 18 in 1975. I've, uh, I've been a public servant, served as a, uh, as a law enforcement officer from the rank of police officer to police chief uh, for, for seven different agencies. Uh, I've been on the council for uh, the last five years. I want to continue to serve our community and I think I have a proven track record showing that I'm consistent and I do my I do the work and the research uh, to make things better. All right. Thank you, Drew. Uh, Guy Redner, why should the people of Clovis elect you to the city council? So uh, unlike a lot of the current candidates, I'm not a business owner. I haven't served in public office. But what I do bring to the table is a unique perspective on Clovis growing up lower middle class. And I think that if you've been in Clovis for any amount of time, you've seen that there is a divide between the South and the North sides. And I think we need, that's a big issue that we need to address. We need to, you know, Clovis is a way of life. Clovis needs to be a way of life for everybody. It's about that community. It's coming back to the homeless and not kicking them out because they're different. It's about accepting them in. It's taking our poor, our sick, our needy, and bringing them in and integrating them into the Clovis way of life. And that is something I want to bring to the table. Last word, why should you be elected to the Clovis City Council? Sure. Uh, I, I would think out of uh, all the candidates running, I probably have the broadest amount of experience. I'm currently work for a city. I'm a department head in the city. I know how city government works. I'm probably one of the few people who's actually prepared a staff report. Uh, I've actually prepared, uh, done grants this year. Probably I've written over $3 million worth of grants for the city of Madera. Uh, the other is my, my experience is uh, in the private sector. Fortune 100, I've been an executive uh, for Apple Computer, Hewlett Packard, Compaq, Pelco. Uh, I've also ran a nonprofit, so I have public sector experience. I worked in aerospace for a while. I actually did have a, a, a top secret clearance at one point. Uh, I think I br bring a different perspective on consensus building, teamwork, and uh, just getting cooperation from people. And I think my voice would represent a lot of people who feel like their voice is not being currently heard in this city. And that's what I bring to the table. And All right. I, I would hope that they elect me. Joe Bear, Drew Bessinger, Guy Redner, thank you so much for joining us in this Clovis Debate Forum. 
Remember, you have until November 8th to return your ballots. They should be out. They should be uh, in your mailbox. If they haven't been already, contact the clerk of the county, and they will help you out there. And remember, you get the government you vote for. I am David Taub with GBY. Thank you very much for joining us. And now we will turn the show to Darius Asemi. Thank you, David. Uh, what a great uh, debate. <clears throat> great panel you had on with Drew, Guy, and Joe. Uh, great questions and, and great insights. Uh, I hope that the viewers uh, got as much out of it as, as I did. And I know Dr. Fogg, he has some great questions as well. Um, my uh, final comments before I turn it over to Dr. Fogg is uh, please vote. It's one of the most important uh, opportunities we have as Americans to exercise our democracy to, for representative government, something that I cherish uh, deeply as an immigrant uh, to this beautiful country. Um, with that, we'll see you next Tuesday, but uh, we are going to get to Dr. Fogg in a minute, but next Tuesday on another episode of Unfiltered, and this Thursday, there will be a debate on GB Wire for uh, Clovis Unified um, candidates, I believe it's Area 1. Uh, there's four candidates, and uh, uh, hopefully we get all four on. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned uh, for more information tomorrow morning uh, on GB Wire. Dr. Fogg, you get the last word. Well, thank you. You know, I, you're absolutely right. You, you see the benefit of being able to elect a government that, that leads our country. And, I, and I, I, I would hope that everyone sees how, how critical that is. Because we've got to elect the very best candidate we can. Then we need to hold them accountable. And that's really what it comes to. And yeah. I hope everyone gets involved. I appreciate all, all that will put their name in and actually go out and say, hey, I am willing to do this. I mean, because it takes a lot of thought, effort, a lot of money, and a lot of time to do this. So I, my hat, my, you know, congratulations to all those candidates. But we need, as a community, put the best people in there, hold them accountable, and that's the only way we, we are, can continue to have the environment we have. And thank you for your time to put it on. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Fogg, and thank you to the audience. Thank you, David Taub. Thank uh, you, David. And see you all next week. All right. Take care.